Um, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's, a, it's a real honor and pleasure to be here with you all to talk about this great industry of search. Um, yeah, I've been at the company for about 19 years at Microsoft. So when it was, you know, about 3,000, 4,000 people, and I got there uh, through a uh, roundabout way of working for Reuters, the trading terminals that they do, and they had a real-time data feed into an Excel spreadsheet on Windows uh, 3 or beta, Windows 3.0. And all of the uh, delight that you can use the power of computing and live data stream to manage your portfolio was, uh, was just a fascinating thing to me. And I was right out of college, and I remember Reuters, and they said, hey, you know, you're from college, you must know about these things called computers, figure out what this thing's supposed to do. <laughs> and so I did that for a couple of years and enjoyed it, and I said, I gotta go work in this company that develops great software. And, uh, and at Microsoft, I've been fortuitous to be in a lot of the great places, and there's so many good, uh, great pieces of work going on, but I was there when uh, Windows started, so DOS was, um, DOS was king and OS2 was the future, and Windows was kind of a toy application, and it, it ended up becoming the platform for the company, and I was uh, fortunate to be there, versions, you know, 3.1 through uh, Windows 95, and then the next day, I went to go work on Internet Explorer, and, uh, and it was, uh, again, I was the same close with the developers, and I remember a funny story, I'm in the, I'm in the office with one, one of our star developers, and when you're in you know, product management, uh, the key thing is you got to be uh, type of developers. So you say, hey, you should come in, you got to see this thing. And so you go in, and it's a classic developer's office, all dark, all these monitors up. He was watching this. He types in ping, you know, some numbers that you all recall. We sit there, and then comes back one thing, one thing, one thing. And I said, well, what, what happened? He said, oh, I just sent this data packet from here to Zurich to, uh, to Italy to Brazil and back to Seattle in less than a second. So that's amazing. What's it mean? He said, I have no idea. <laughs> he said, it's going to be hot, but it's been Yeah, I was like, okay, I'm going to work on that. So I worked on Internet Explorer versions, you know, one through five, uh, and, uh, and then uh, uh, came to the online group in MSN um, for a while in MSN. Uh, I actually ran an engineering for a period of time when we started our search service. So I was there when we started search, and that was also a fun story. Uh, we were in the office, and while we were debating the entering search as a company, it's a, it's a you know, now a multi-billion dollar investment. We, so we asked one of the developers, hey, see if you can write a crawl, something that can go crawl the web. Uh, let's see if we can even do it. You know? and, uh, and so one of the guys came over, he wrote this crawler, and he came back and said, okay, I crawled 48 documents, and then the server kicked over. I said, all right, well, that's the start. You know? And we started that with literally the server and the plug, and someone kicked over 48 uh, documents, and now we're off to uh, so uh, many more, and so, and then most recently uh, on May, uh, May and MSN, and uh, it's been uh, a fantastic opportunity to be a part of um, the momentum that really started with Spain, and uh, so that's, and then you blink your eyes and 19 years goes by. Wow. So let's just talk about the, uh, the changes yeah. in search, and you guys came in at a later stage, but exactly the same kind of thing, you know, we've got this protocol, HTTP, uh, HTML documents, you go up and call the web, you come back with your 48 documents and think, Try harder yeah. kind of thing, so you have to build a core. It is a very, very difficult task, isn't it, going to work and trying to pull this all of this data together and trying to make some sense of it because it's completely unstructured data. Yeah? Yes. Oh, it's, it's a super hard problem. I mean, for a period of time, I know a year ago, every, uh, I think it was every second of every day in that year, there were four new URLs created. So you think about the explosion of the tail and the fact that you have to crawl index and make sense of that. And that's just even on the old metaphor search. Um, and then the other thing, interesting thing is that on any, in any given month, about a third of our queries that show up is the first time we've ever seen that query. And then a huge chunk of those we'll never see again. They're just gone into the wind, poof, you know. And so the, the, the challenge of basically being able to be up to speed to understand that inflow of data and then to be able to index the right thing so that you can respond in some second time, the right answer, very, very hard problem. And then, and then the problem that gets harder as you move into like these new forms of data that you just mentioned, like um, unstructured data. You know, and so now you're saying, well, um, how do I get to things that are closed off? How do I get to you know, Twitter feeds or YouTube videos or things that you can't actually crawl easily? And if all of these are coming in new formats, you know, bitly URLs, for example, you can't really crack those. So the whole page link architecture that everyone just really understands quite well, what happens when you can't understand the URL to improve your ranking? So that's really interesting because obviously we have a very hardcore of uh, people that come to the conference who are uh, mainly interested in the organic side of the business, you know, the, uh, the SEO side of the business. Um, and fundamentally we still talk 
about the old page factors that are involved in some, you know, we'll, uh, we'll want to link it to the, uh, in a moment. But uh, when you bring all of this data together and you're looking at documents, I mean, obviously, way back in the day, the only documents you had, so I got you know, basic HTML, it was all about text, the video on graphic, and things have changed now, particularly with the introduction of these blended results. So we have videos, and we have PDF documents, and we have images, and all of those kind of things. Um, in terms of uh, the, the job that these guys have to do, you know, when you're looking at an HTML page, and we'll look at other five times in a moment, uh, how important is that on page stuff? I mean, you know, making sure that you've got the title tags and you've got the keywords in the right place of the document, and are H1 tags important? And I'm always curious to know in terms of the way that we have to do this job, which way you do it. Do you start that level as a top down thing? Um, I mean, there, there isn't anything I would say, I'll uh, answer in a couple ways. One is there isn't anything out of the ordinary that people um, aren't usually doing today that you would expect. And we have a whole site up on Webmaster Center on our big site that explains it. But it's, it is the classic things in terms of making your HTML pages well designed and well formed so that they're easily crawlable and, and, and the relevancy is on them. That's the case. But, I want to go to a different thing that you brought up, uh, your question you said, which is how are things changed? You know, because it, and, and this is a big part, I think, for here as you plan the future. The thing that's the biggest change for the consumer is that search, you know, which was invented, you know, however many years ago, 12, 20, whatever you want to count, was really initially very good at navigation. So the whole point was, I need to go find a website, what's the UPS website, what's the United Airlines website, and, uh, and then page rank which was a, was a great genius invention, it was all about, let me understand the anchor text of the URLs and the linking, because that is how, that's probably the best way to find relevance. And that was the case for navigation, today is still the case for navigation. But what's changed now is that consumers are using search in a different way. In particular, they're using search now to conduct transactions, they're using search for advanced research, and they're trying to do things with search that search is not designed to do. And what happens then is the way that, you know, and I'll give you an example. So if, if the old query was, what's the American Airlines website? The new query is, where does uh, President Obama stand in healthcare? What are the five causes of a certain type of pancreatic cancer? And, uh, and, and trying to think about how you formulate that as a query, very hard, how you answer that in terms of search results also changes. And what happens then is, we've got to say, let's design uh, the next generation of search that can handle those types of tasks, where the answer is less fuzzy, and, 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 it, and in a way, it's more of a dialogue with the consumer. So it isn't, give me 2.8 keywords, and that will return back for you uh, the 10 best links on the web. It's more, tell me what you're looking for, and then in a way, I'll help guide you back to what you want. So when you think about things, for folks in this room, how do you take advantage of that? The thing you have to have in your mind now is consumers, are, they are looking for something other than links. They're looking for complete answers, and they're looking for, in a way, almost decision support tools, because they're coming to search engines to do that. It's, it's a, it's a mind-boggling thing. So in many ways, when I think about the, the SEO community, I think very much of it as, in a way, developers for search. And we'll talk a bit more about that. But I think of it as where you're actually helping publishers uh, and advertisers design uh, a different way to help the user accomplish these tasks. Uh, part, part of I think what's been the success of Bing is we've done a huge amount of uh, data mining and data understanding and you talk about search sessions and change and that, that has been a, a big, big breakthrough for us is we watch you know, on an anonymous basis and you can see how someone will actually conduct a task. So if we used to think that, okay, when someone sits down and types in those, those 2 point keywords, that the result that they get back, that's going to be what they need at that moment. But it turns out that for things like commerce, uh, it, it, it's mind-boggling. How, like when someone types in, let's say, a travel query, what percent of the time do you, like what, at what time do you think someone will make a purchase? Any guesses? <laughs> Anybody want to guess? More than, uh, more than 60% of the time, uh, the actual purchase on that query, the initial query, won't happen for uh, two to four weeks. So think about, think about at the time, what you're, whether you're buying a keyword ad, or you're trying to provide a response back, in that first query, they don't do that. In fact, if you, if, in fact, if you study and watch, we see how people kind of navigate slowly and say, well, first I'll do some research, and I'll do the following, and then of course you know, oh, well, they've thrown it in. 
or they have to go do some piece of work. Then they come back later at night. Then they compare with their spouse or their friends. Then they come back. And we've done this for so many things, in particular people, places, and things. And you see how the, the, the chain and usage of things change. And that is, um, that's been eye-opening for us. And uh, again, even let's take, for example, a car. You do a query for a car. Usually what happens is, you know, again, today, page rank, let's get you the link. But if you think about it here, if you and I are in a conversation and say, I need a new car, how would you respond back? You don't say, oh, you know, here's your website. You say, well, what kind of car are you looking for? So, you know, a new car? Oh, you put, what do you want? You want a sports car? Yeah, I'd like a sports car. What's your budget? What's my budget? Okay, well, then you can come back now. You can come back and say, oh, well, hey, there's, here's a couple cars in your range. They've got these trim packages and et cetera. And, and that's the dialogue model I'm talking about. That's what people use in search engines. And so the way to help them is not necessarily so good to get that link up. It's in a way, how do we come back and help you with that task? Yeah. And that task is unique and different for all sorts of birds. And I, I kind of use this analogy that um, uh, the more that you, you know about the end user, like we've been looking at search engines for such a long time. You look at the search engine and you think it's a black box that you invented and there's voodoo and nobody knows what goes on inside it without realizing that the search engine is looking back at you and you're a black box and they have no idea what goes on inside of you. So the bigger that information exchange is and the more relevant uh, the result is and, and the easier the task becomes. Yeah? Uh, so that's right on the money. That, that, that is the way I think about our vision. So you know, if you compare or contrast our vision with uh, other players, Everyone has like a unique approach, and, and no approach necessarily is right or wrong, but it's different. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the other visions is digitize the world's information. That's, and make it useful. That's a noble goal, that's a decade hard problem. You know, you know, you know well, I mean, but it's a great goal. Uh, the way I can trust what we're trying to do, and how I think search will be different from our point of view, is we are about, just like you said, understanding the user intent, and then mapping that intent into task and into action. And that's also a very hard problem. That, in some ways, I think it's almost a harder problem, understanding user intent. It's almost like, can you build the ultimate blind reader so that when someone pulls out their phone or sits at their computer, before they start typing, we have a decent sense of, okay, well, okay, where is this person, that long, what time of day, how fast are they moving, are they at 60 miles an hour, or 2 miles an hour, or are they stationary, um, you know, what's on their upcoming appointments, so that when they start to type, you say, okay, now we understand most likely the intent of that moment. You know, SEO is still around, there are all of those best practices. Uh, just for a couple of minutes, let's talk about one of the best things that we need to do to be able to get found at day. You know, I mean, uh, the keyword research obviously is extremely important to understand user intent, on page, linkage. Is it just for, for a minute or so, what do you think is best practice to, to be found at day? Yeah, uh, well, so you talked about a bunch of those. I think making sure, I mean, again, on our site, we have a place to make sure that your URL is crawled properly. Um, that uh, I mean, the way we we don't get into the details of how we do most of the ranking, but um, again, making sure that the, that the proper keywords are there. We, we're very focused on matching the relevancy of the keywords that we read off your page with the page itself and the landing. That, that, that the descriptor of the anchor text, etc., is, is accurate, and because that's a lot of how we think about. Okay, is this is this page actually relevant to the content that's on there? Those are those are some of the primary things that we'll do. So I think anchor text has been the workhorse really of search for a very, for a very long time. I think you, know, you alluded to that before, but we talked about page rank. I think it probably applies more to link anchor text than it does to a, to a specific page. So yeah. I think that's a very important thing to take away that uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, having a great title tag is very, very important. Uh, obviously, it says a lot about the page, but the more that you can have the link anchor text that yeah. describes the target page, then yeah. and the closer that is to the query, I guess. Yeah. And then some of the things that we can, I can show you in some, in some of the product you know, is where things will go and how I think you start to think about, okay, in addition to the, the, the linking and the keywords and the HTML page, what can you do with applications? What can you do with richer answers on the page? And that's where I think, uh, in a big part of, I you know, if you think about it, the SEO industry, I think that's where we'll head. And then it's baby steps and we have a ways to go, but we can kind of maybe show a little bit of where things will head. A couple minutes and show you a few things that are coming so you get a a, a view of some of the things that Mike and I were talking about, how will search change. So I'll start um, here on our homepage, and you guys know a little bit about um, the page that you've used today, and you can see that, you know, that we start out with just a new visual approach, a new kind of graphical approach that lets you discover information. And this has been 
some of it has been very hot with kids in schools. In fact, in the elementary schools, this is the dominant homepage people have switched over because just because of the beauty of discovery. I want to start with a, first with a, a, a query, and a query on, for example, Taylor Swift. Uh, first, I want to talk about people, places, and things. Now, one of these you'll see is, you know, in the past you'd come up and you'd get, for example, some links, and then little by little people sprinkle in some content. One of the things that we're doing is we're adding a bunch of information here in this, this box that effectively becomes the answer. We'll start by, for example, calling out this is the official site, uh, and we link to it. We'll have images. But one of the things that, you uh, that we start to do is we start to understand a little bit about this is not just a page with uh, keywords. This is an entity. This is a person. And so here on the left rail at the top, I want to call your attention to how we have made, yet again, another big bet with the user experience in search, taking what is probably one of the most valuable real estate, a lot of pain. And we start to basically bring topics uh, to bear. So for example, Taylor Swift, we know is an artist. And so we find songs, lyrics, or ringtones. Of course, we can find related searches because we start to draw inferences about what are other musical artists, what are the things that are, are related here. And you can come in and find that. And then along the top, this is a new thing that we're just introducing. And this will also start to show up in our user experience in flights, one to 5% flights, starting today, um, if you get lucky to the flight. Because we have the ability to come in and then look at different topics on that, uh, on that concept. So for example, Taylor Swift, people do a lot of searches for uh, images, uh, like Western News, uh, or even for, uh, even for events. And so I can come in, so for example, in this case, we know she is a performer, and so here's a list of events that are coming up. And we can pull it out, and I can go ahead and click on events, and I can then refine my query. So for example, hey, I want to see where she's playing this weekend. Okay, she's playing in uh, Auburn's Hills. I can pick that particular one, and I can come in and actually buy tickets. And so what you can see is now a very easy way for the consumer to say, I want to discover that artist, let me go find them. Another example is, for, uh, let's say you want to do travel. So I'm looking to go uh, in spring break, let's go to Miami Beach. And I'll type in Miami Beach, and again, we pull up a whole entity card, and we know this is an entity now. So on the left, we know, okay, well, related to this entity is probably hotels, tourism. We know that there are different parts of Miami that are probably hot, like South, South Beach. We know about, you know, spas, resorts, etc. And so we're pulling this intelligence out. Uh, you can come in and look at things like the weather, or flight details, or we even aggregate a bunch of information. So for example, you can come in and slideshow, and in one click, you have a full screen experience, so you can actually discover, and maybe take a look at the place that you're thinking of traveling, uh, very, very easy. And again, this really resonates with, with consumers. They, they really are, they get tired of the links and the text, and they want to come in and see the images, see the visuals, as a way to discover information. I'll come back out here, and what we'll do is I'll come back, and I can even now let's say, okay, I need to book a flight. So we talked about it. do they need to go right to the a particular airline site, or do they need some help in finding that? We've now introduced a number of tools. So one of the great tools we have here with uh, being travel is the ability to see the prices and these algorithms to define whether the prices are going to go up or down. So they will save a decent amount of money with the prediction they tend, and we give you the confidence rate of how likely we are to be accurate. And then once you decide, you can come into the calendar, see what flights are available, and then we'll take you all the way through this decision support system to actually help answer it. So for example, here are all the prices, uh, you know, from lowest to highest, and you can come in and refine your query nonstop with a particular airline. So again, what happens is we're, we're taking this in a direction where it is helping you get the task done, not just getting you the links. Uh, finally, I want to show you something here. Here's the New York Times. We understand this concept of the, the, the times that it is, in fact, an entity. Uh, and what we'll say, what we'll do is, in addition to the official site and deep links, we have a customer service number. One of the hardest problems to find is the customer service number for any company. We, we know how to go and find that deep on their page. And our challenge is to find customer service number for a, a, a classic retail. It's very hard. We'll pull it right to the top of the page. And one of the things that we just introduced now with the real-time information is we can pull the most popular shared links on that topic. So for, from the New York Times, we can see what links are most shared about the Times. And by clicking on it, these end up being the stories. So now you get great insight. Not only do you see you know, the, the news that's going on, you can actually come and see the links that are being shared and scroll through here. So it's a very powerful feature. And just in general, we have the full firehose of Twitter. And you can see what topics are trending, et cetera. So that gives you a little bit of a sense of, um, of, of, of that.
I want to you know, finish that section by talking to you a little bit about the, the car example we talked about. So let's say that I want to find a new car. There's now a whole different way to talk to start your search. So here's a visual way. These are all the cars that are new. And I can scroll through and find the one I want. Because the studies show that the human eye can detect at 40 times better something that they're looking for versus looking at it for text. So I can scroll that way, or I can say, for example, all right, you know, I think Michael needs to tell me he's looking maybe for a sports car. So I can say, show me all the sports cars. And then uh, let's figure out your price tag. Let's keep it, uh, let's keep it down to 25000 And then up come the cars that fit that price range. And I can say, okay, Ford Mustang. And I come in and I can see the car. We'll have specs, safety, et cetera, on that car if I want to. I can come in and see all of the information about that. And I can read all the reviews. So an incredibly rich way to discover and explore information. The second thing I wanted to show you was uh, how that will go forward into the, the, the mobile area. And so what I have here is a very uh, hot and rare device. I uh, don't take this one. We're done with the demo. This is one of the new Windows uh, Phone 7 series. Uh, incredibly hard to find. I had an arm wrestle to get one. Uh, it's very much in prototype mode. And what I want to do is I want to show you a little bit about how a script will change on the mobile device. One of the things that's fantastic about these Windows mobile phones is that they are context sensitive and aware. So as, as we talked about, they know your location, they know how fast you're moving if you're in a car, so if you're looking for directions, and you're moving 60 miles an hour, we'll give you driving directions. If you're moving two miles an hour, we'll give you walking directions. You know? And if you're, if you're stationary, then we'll send them to you. So here's the user experience. Go ahead and pull that up. And uh, so you get this uh, nice home screen, and this is again will be a lot like you see on uh, the big home page. And what I'm able to do is I'm able to you know, scroll up and down, you know, very nice touch screen. And there's a button on here, the big button, I'll press the big button. And up will come our home page uh, that we've seen before with the hot links. And I can come in and actually just do a query. So for example, let's, this, this phone I just took from uh, Vegas. So we'll see we're here in Vegas and I'll type in sushi. And on that, up will come on all of the, the latest restaurants that are right near me. We could pick, for example, the Buddha Cafe. And what you'll see is we have the ratings for it, we have the directions. We even, even have uh, useful information. So, for example, on hours, it says no lunch. And I can actually read all the reviews. We'll go out to the web, extract all the reviews. And if, uh, if afterwards I want to do something, I can come in and click nearby and see what other events are around nearby. And I do that with that. So it gives you some sense of how that will change on the, uh, on the phone. The final thing I wanted to, the final section of what I wanted to show you was around uh, the area of mapping and how things are changing in the geospatial. And that this is a, in particular, a big area in terms of how search is going forward. Uh, local and commerce, in particular, will be a very big thing, I think, as, at least as we see search evolving. And I want to show you a couple of thoughts here. First of all, for those who haven't seen it, I just want to show you the big maps. We've done a huge amount of work to get a very uh, fast and highly performing map uh, application that lets me just, with the scroll button, scroll all the way down from up in the air satellite to get all the way down into the city. And you can see how performant this is. I can scroll around, this is New York City here. And you can see how easy you can just zoom in and out to any place. Go all the way back out, see the map, and get down to New York. So you can see how fast the performance is. And one of the things you can do is I can come in, for example, and say, let's go to Hilton, New York City, and we will automatically find you and zoom you right down to the map. And as in New York, there's a number of them. And we'll say, this is the right one here. And it finds you here. And then I can say, with one click, I can say, tell me what's nearby. Okay, then we will automatically find for you where are the hotels, where are the restaurants, where are the bars nearby, the museums. So again, as a consumer, finding information now becomes much more powerful because you don't have to go and tell it all these things. You just say, hey, I'm at that Hilton, New York, what should I do? And Bing will automatically bring up a whole number of things for you in this area, and then you can explore. So again, it's more of a dialogue model. The consumer is dialoguing with the system, if you will, to find information. Another example is uh, a great little application called the Museum, which basically shows you the, um, the front page of major newspapers anywhere uh, around uh, the globe. So for example, here we're up in Seattle, so we can look, here's the Seattle Times, one of the extra families in MVP. I can come down to the page there. I can go down to California and see what's happening with San Jose Mercury News. The San Francisco Chronicle, there it is. 
And then I can scroll back if I want, and I can go across the pond, as they say, and I can see The Guardian in the UK. And I can uh, click on that, and I can see, for example, or I go to the journal, what are the, what are the front pages of those papers? So for example, let's see. Irish Examiner. Yeah, they'll come up and you'll actually see the front page of that, that, that page as well. And then, uh, then one of the things I want to show you is that we have a number of new applications as well that basically are new applications. And so we talked about how the future of search will change and how you can write applications to help, help uh, get answers. Some of those were those instant answers you saw in search. Some of them can be map applications. And so one of those, for example, I want to show you is the Twitter maps. And what we've done is we take a live feed of Twitter and we can put it right on the page here and, and take a look. So for example, let me do, uh, let me do a couple of things. Let me filter so we'll just see tweets just to have uh, photos in them. So I'll show these. And as things start to you know, tweet in real time, what we'll do is we bring together the, the power of real time tweeting uh, right onto the page. And so you can see here, I can scroll back over the period of time and see previous tweets with photos. And I was looking at this before we started. Here, for example, is a picture of the Hilton um, taken about uh, 13 hours ago. So, so someone probably coming in a little late, uh, late at night. And you can sort of see, uh, you can see what's happening there. So you get a sense again of how that real-time information um, comes in. And these are apps you can do today. Now I want to show you something that uh, is prototype and coming coming soon. Uh, that's not yet uh, not yet here. And this is uh, how we take now the power of both all of our imagery, plus the ability of consumers to interact, as we were talking with the engine, and then the live feeds in one example. So here is high place marketing. This is taking now at street level view. We basically drive cars around the globe, and we take photos, you know, two feet off the ground on these cars with cameras, and you can scroll around and see the actual location that you're at. So if you're looking for a business, you can come in and look at that. And one of the things that are, is pretty interesting is you can come down and we can say, for example, hey, show me pictures. When people take you know, user-generated photos, we can take those photos and we can overlay them on this map. So for example, we will find one here. This is now, what I'll do is I'll overlay. This is a photo someone took, and we overlaid it on the map. We, we understand a, the 3D world, and it's an accurate representation, and then we, we geocode it so that when you take a photo, we know where to put it. One of the things we can do, for example, is I can take an old photo. So for example, let's say I want to understand what Pike Place work that looked like um, you know, many years ago. So here's a picture of it back in 1919. Okay? And it's overlaid on the exact location. So for example, if you said, you know, what, what did this look like back then if I was standing here night, uh, about you know, almost 100 years ago, what would that look like? I can do that picture. And I can say, for example, what if it what if it's nighttime? What does, what does the thing look like at nighttime? I can click on that. And you can say this is a look at it in the evening. So you start to get the power of that, of people overlaying and then being able to go in there. Now, what I'll show you is, let's say I'm, I can actually drive down as if I'm actually headed down the street. And so as I'm looking for a business, I can look around. Now let's say that you want to come see this notion of people um, you know, if you guys have been to Seattle, the Pike Market, but what they do is they throw these fish around, and you can actually see um, you can actually see them throwing the fish. And let's say we want to see that. Now, imagine that thing I showed you with Twitter, where you have a real-time data stream. Let's take a real-time data stream that is a video feed, overlay that, geocode it in exactly the right place, which is one of the things we've done. So here is a video live. Well, it was like we shot a lot of, the, of in, the, in the market of guy throwing fish in that exact area. And what you can imagine is now, very quickly in the future, you'll be able to say, oh, before I go out to get my coffee, let me just zoom into the maps and see how long the line is at Starbucks. You know, let me see, in fact, if that bus is coming down the street, so before I run out my door, I know how fast I have to run. And that, this here you have amazing power of geospatial data. We've, built, we've rented a 3D accurate picture, and then you can overlay, and as other people overlay videos or content, you can get these richness in. So super, super powerful.
All right, and the last thing I want to close on is I want to show you a new application that is going to come soon. In fact, we're going to roll it out in the next couple of days. And um, it's with another very hot effort that is um, um, uh, that's emerging the web through a, a little partnership we have with a company called Foursquare. And to do that, what I want to do is I, I ran into him here. He's the CEO of Foursquare. Dennis Crowley, I want to invite him up. We were uh, having coffee yesterday. I said, hey, why don't you join me on the stage? And we'll show that app that we're going to uh, collectively beta in the next couple of days. And so he said, sure, why not? We'll come up and talk a little bit about Foursquare. So please welcome to Dennis. So Dennis, let's just show a little bit about uh, the Foursquare app, and then, uh, and then you can talk a little bit about what's going on. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, I'll pull it up here. So what you see is um, a little bit like we showed before uh, with Twitter. I can come in now, and I can, I can zoom down into New York City. And what will happen is, once we get down there, we can start to see the activity that people have. Uh, and, and, and people post, post information, they check into places. And what you'll see is, uh, I'll show you something here, they start, to, they start to show up on the site, and you can see them scrolling in real time. And Dennis, why don't you tell them a little bit about what, what, what Foursquare is and what people are doing here yeah, live on the site. Uh, I'm assuming, have a bunch of you used Foursquare before? I, I saw that about two dozen people were checked in at the conference, and specifically in this room, which is kind of great. The Foursquare lets you check into places and share the places that you go with friends. And we also have a layer of game mechanics on things that reward people for doing interesting things. So you can earn badges for going to multiple karaoke places or exploring different uh, barbecue joints and even leave different tips all around, you know, all around the city, all around the world for your friends to discover. So it's not uncommon to sit down at a restaurant, check into a place, and a message will pop up from a friend of yours telling you what to order or what to try or, you know, what to talk to the bartender about. Um, and so, I mean, this is one of the first visualizations that we've seen of course where data is showing up in real time. So you can imagine the next time that you come to New York or the next, you know, whenever you go back home, you can use these maps to, you know, really explore your city in a different way and, and unearth some of this content in a, in a different manner. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing nice stuff. And so, yeah, so I'll just zoom out just to, hopefully I'll come back to the U.S. And you can see what's pretty you know, fascinating here is that picture of the U.S. And as people start to update, you can see people checking in live. And so one of the things that's powerful here is uh, when, when people post information, it's getting disaggregated from the local context. And what, we're, what you can do now with the maps is you can re-aggregate. So you can now bring again the locality of what is going on when people post information, reassemble it here in real time, and get a sense. So as Dennis was saying, if suddenly there's a big music conference, he was at recently South by Southwest, you can go down to Austin, Texas, and see all of the activities going on and quickly get a sense of what's the pulse, what are people saying, where are the bars to go, what bands are hot. And that you can get now in a vision. Imagine doing that in a visual way on the map, and that's really the big opportunity. Yeah, so you can see here, there's a whole bunch of people that are unlocking badges for, you know, for being the mayor of a particular venue, for being there more than anyone else, for this, uh, the red and yellow ones, for being the local, for that being your local spot. I saw one in the, uh, uh, all the way in the West Coast, which is a camera icon, which means someone found a place with a photo booth. So there's all these interesting things you can unlock. Of course, this is one of the first times we've really been able to visualize it uh, on a map like this, which is great. So anyways, that was, that was all I wanted to do. Thanks, Dennis. Great. Thanks for having me. I appreciate yeah. it. The, the world is changing quite a lot, and I think you saw there are some of the ways I think that uh, I think the experience will change for consumers. And um, this is the first time we showed it. It's, like I said, I think it's going to go live today, so we wanted to wait to show it to you first here. And then we well, thank you for all that fantastic, yeah. it was a great yeah. demonstration. Yeah. The question: The question is, what is, how what does this mean for shopping comparison sites? Since we showed a couple of examples where you can do some shopping comparison, and I think that there are. Uh, we still believe there are many opportunities for comparison sites for shopping, for travel, etc. What we try and do there is provide one one set of um, you know capabilities. But if you and I won't go back to it, if you wanted to, for example, travel, you can actually when we go take you through the funnel, you can still ultimately before you buy go and say, hey, I want to go compare this with other sites, and we'll actually have those, some of those sites listed on the page. And so, uh, in many cases, we are doing some of that functionality, but we still provide the link off to a number of different sites. Yes, so, yeah, so it is quite interesting when you think about it from the end user point of view that what's happened in search previously is that um, people come to, uh, uh, to Microsoft as it was before or, or to Google and they do a search and you get 10 new links, you click on one of those and they catapult off somewhere else and now you're on a journey of your own whereas in this type of approach we can just sit here and you'll just keep feeding us the information back in. We don't have to go the tracking around it. Yeah, I think the key, exactly, the key thing whether you're an advertiser or a publisher is 
I don't see lots of traffic. Give me the qualified traffic. <laughs> and when someone comes, can you pass context for me? Like, are they ready to buy now, or are they still in research mode? So that when they come to you, you better able to deliver results for them. A question down here. Yeah, oh, th thank you. Great presentation on that. Uh, as, as Mike said, um, the, uh, unlocking the black box that is you, that the person actually interacting with the search engine is an important component for you to provide this uh, richer and richer experience. So what are the, some of the ways that uh, you will be getting that information or encouraging people to volunteer the information which will help provide that experience? Yeah, I think it's a great question, and, and uh, it's really right on the money. People, um, everyone has different levels of comfort with the privacy of who they are and, and how, how you are done, and we respect that in, in a very deep way. So we have on Microsoft sites the ability to go in and delete any information that we have on you at any time. So if you want to delete all of it, the cookies, you can go up and do that. But to your point, um, people will expect value in return. So they'll say, hey, I'm happy to share some information about myself. If you can return back to me either better products or better answers uh, or value of different kinds. And on our approach will be two efforts. One is we'll show you some of these features. So there's a feature up there on search history. In fact, I think it should be on that, should be on that page and it will be up there uh, soon where you'll be able to, to go and look at the history results. But you can clear that or you can say never show me history again. The benefit of history in this case is that what we've studied, 50% of all um, searches for any given user are repeat searches. And so we're able to then provide that. When you do the auto-suggest and I start typing in that box and we do a drop-down, we will bring your history in that dialog box. So there will be different ways that we'll return value. No question like that. Uh, given uh, Google's actions in uh, China this week, I was just wondering uh, what, how Microsoft plans to respond. Are they going to try to uh, move in more heavily to China or are they going to um, uh, respond in kind as to what Google is doing? Yeah, so the question is, what, what, what is Microsoft's uh, position in China um, and, and how does it compare relative to other people's efforts? Um, you know, I, I think they're really, it, everyone has their own point of view on how to approach things. And so we, you know, we, don't, we don't judge on that. Microsoft's approach has been um, that we're in over 100 countries and on a worldwide basis where they all have different laws and, and, and how people will, are supposed to behave, this is supposed to behave. And we respect those uh, and, we'll, and we'll follow those laws. Our view on the best way to help consumers around the globe is to be an active participant uh, in helping shape that in the country. And I think you can have more impact being there in the country, uh, helping folks provide the service. And so that's the approach that we will take. Uh, and we will work with, with many parties on that. that that's our approach. Good question, right there. Um, all these features that you're showing are really, really cool, really exciting, and look really fun. But I'm wondering how the businesses can monetize these opportunities. Um, absolutely. So there, I think there are a couple different ways. Um, some of them, like I said, uh, on, let's say, the very first part of the demonstration we showed. What happens there is you're able to get better context for the consumer. And so what I think you'll start to see is the type of ads that you buy will change. And so, um, like I said to you before, if you know that this person is at point X in the purchase funnel, they're in the research phase, then the type of ad and the type of ad text that you should show at the time should be more things about exploring. If you know they're in the, at the point of purchase, then it's probably maybe more deal offer related because you know now it's time to purchase. So the first part will be the type of ads. In the second one, uh, like in more of the mapping demo area, that's a whole different set of experiences of how you monetize it. One of the things I think that's interesting on the Foursquare that Dennis and I are talking about is there are different ways that you know, uh, merchants will provide um, customer loyalty options. So for example, they did a Starbucks badge where if you come in often, you can actually help provide and some value in that respect. Some of those will be maybe more commerce related. They won't be advertising related at all. They'll be helping make a purchase. Uh, but I can understand the user intent. If you get to the point of transaction, is there any point in showing these organic listings? Why wouldn't you just show all paid ads? Because you know, for a fact, I'm sitting with a credit card. Yeah, uh, it's a, it's a, again, it's a good question. Um, you're saying that at the point of purchase, would you just move to ads? Um, you know, I mean, theoretically, that could be possible. I think uh, one of the great things here is it's all driven by data. And so, in fact, our decision of when we show ads or not ads is all, all based on some great and relevancy, uh, as well as a number of other factors. And so, um, I think that'll be some of the things we play with. But ultimately, users really do like to, it's an interesting balance. While they like to have the exact answer, they also like to make sure that they have choice. So a lot of times we'll show something, and like some of the feedback we had on earlier is that people said, hey, awesome that you showed me the lowest price, but I need to see all the prices, or I won't feel like I really did get the lowest price. 
So I need to see that the other one knows those. How do I know those questions? Right. And so it's interesting. So sometimes ease of use and convenience and trust are all interwoven together. Interesting. Good question. Maybe I'll. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. I guess the first one's my hand up, so I'm sneaking in here. Um, it's similar to what you just said. How many of those results were SEO and how many of those were SEM? There is no way to tell. And um, I think that's the way we're, or do we have to think differently about how to work with Bing? In other words, um, you know, how did you serve up most of those results and results in the first half of that, you know, your talk? Yeah, are you talking about the, the rich caption, the rich answer, or the links below it? Both. Both. The rich, yeah, the rich caption is something that we assemble together. Um, where we pull data from different sites, and that's something that we uh, that's something that we do. And again, we measure whether people like that or not based on the a number of factors like click through rate. The rest of them, um, the rest of them are basically the, the links in the same way that we described before. And so, um, how we rank those and how we do all that, we don't we probably don't get into all of the details, but it's, it should be consistent with uh, how SEOs and SEMs participate in that user experience today. So again, I've used this term uh, multimodal before. I tend to use it a lot now because it seems to be that it's a lot more about partnerships. I mean, the partnership with Foursquare, the partnership that Microsoft has with Twitter to tap into that feed to get more of the real-time stuff that's uh, that's going on. So you, you're kind of optimizing around a number of different sources and, and what I call signals, a signals, a number of different signals. Yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. I mean, I think uh, you hit a key word. Data signals is a thing that I think we all think about. It's really opened our eyes, I would say, over the last year about how core that has become to us being able to do this and understand user intent. And so signals of data come from all sorts of things like we talked about, whether it is, you know, your lap along or the speed of what you're moving or the time of day or things on your calendar. It can also be just the signals on how you use the search engine. You know, how fast did you dwell? Did you hover? Did you click and come back? All these signals are things that we put in, and you know you can't have too many signals, really. I mean, you yeah. can have a hard computing problem, but you can't have too much data on the data detail. I think we have one more question up here. Uh, yes, this was a great user-centered experience, very rich, um, and we actually can get everything at our fingertips without leaving Bing. I, I didn't really see you going to uh, to an actual website which is great for the user. So I'm wondering, um, am I missing these visitors on my website? Um, I cannot track them. Um, how, how do I see partnership with the data? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, I think a couple of things. I didn't, the reason you didn't see the click through the website is just because I just didn't demonstrate going through the website. But there's absolutely a lot of huge amount of click-through. In fact, as I said before, what we found is more click-throughs occur when we put some of the richer uh, richer captions on there than, than less. Uh, and so, in many cases, they do drive more click-through. But to your question of how will you work in the future, one of the things that we're you know really thinking a lot about is how do we open up so that some of those things that we do aren't all just done by Microsoft? How, how do we open it up so maybe other third parties can come in and provide the own, uh, the own efforts, even in the core search results. I showed you on the maps how um, the different application vendors can provide an app on the map, but even in the core of the search results, we're, we're playing with the notion of is there a, is there a rich caption, richer caption that someone can come and provide, and they can and then people can interact on that page before they let's say click through. And so different thoughts in that area that we're also um, spend a lot of time thinking about. So I think that's been uh, certainly a great conversation and uh, really pleased that we were able to make it and uh, thanks for making it exclusive uh, for us. Absolutely fascinating to look at how much the end user is beginning to drive and, and become in charge of the search results and, and you know, become a bit more demanding. You know? It was a great look at the future. Please say thank you to our music